Hello everyone. Before we start today's video, I want to talk about our sponsor, Prime Gaming. Now, as you probably know, Prime Gaming is included for free with your Amazon Prime membership. But apparently, there is a bit more to Prime Gaming than just giving me your Prime sub every month on Twitch. It turns out you can get tons of exclusive items for over 30 games every single month, and every month they also offer some games that you can just get completely for free. So let's check out some of the things that they have to offer. We have some stuff for Apex Legends, GTA, Legends of Runeterra, Doom Eternal, Rainbow Six, League of Legends, Warframe, the game Stellaris, just straight up the game. This is like 30 or 40 bucks. Claim it, boom, it's yours. If we keep scrolling, we can see a lot of different things. We also see Destiny 2. So this bundle is the Pyrrhic Victory Exotic Bundle Drop. You get an exotic emote, exotic ghost, exotic sparrow, legendary ship, and all you gotta do, link your accounts, hit complete claim, and boom, your items are waiting for you in game. No problem, scoop them up, that's it. And all of this is available until March 2nd, but if you miss this one, look, another one, another one, another, 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 another. There's so many coming. So you can just pick these up every month and just get tons of free stuff for Destiny 2 and all of these other games. So yeah, turns out uh, you can you can keep giving me your Prime sub, but there's also a whole bunch of stuff with Prime Gaming available. So check the link in the description, sign up if you're not signed up already, and get all this stuff. Like, you know, no meme, I'm picking up Stellaris as soon as this video's over. Should be, should be a good one. Season 15, after a long six months, has finally come to a close as we enter the next chapter in Destiny with the Witch Queen. So, how was it? Besides excruciatingly long, pretty good. The overarching story was that of Marasav and Savathun. Turns out Savathun has been playing us for chumps over the past year. Well, several years, but this year in particular. Apparently Osiris, who was being a little sussy baka at the end of season 14, was not actually Osiris, but Savathun in his body. He's actually been trapped away thanks to his little excursion that he did a while back where Sagira, his ghost, had to sacrifice herself in order to save him, which was learned in a Bungie.net lore dump article about a year ago, maybe longer than that, in combination with some recordings that you could play in Zavala's office again sometime last year. Savathun is trapped in a crystal and wants Marasov to expel her worm. Mara actually wanted to use that as a way to strike at Savathun. If you have no idea what expel her worm actually means, might I suggest reading the Books of Sorrow. Fantastic read, but in short, all Hive have a worm inside them that feeds on destruction, violence, etc. Without supplying this to the worm, the worm will instead consume its host. In order to grow more powerful, you need to keep feeding the worm. But this comes at the cost of ever-increasing needs for violence. The Curse on the Dreaming City was essentially Savathun's destruction battery perpetually feeding her worm with waves and waves of curses. Savathun wants this worm out. So over the course of the season, you do astral alignments to find coordinates, and then you venture into the various shattered realms with said coordinates in order to save Tekians who Mara needs in order to expel Savathun's worm. We also got some backstory regarding the Crow, Marasov's brother, him learning about who he really was, old stories from their past, to really flesh him out as a character and how he may impact the future. I know this seems like stuff from a completely different season because it all happened back in, like, October, but trust me, it, it happened this season. The final mission was the exorcism of said worm. However, instead of expelling the worm and being able to destroy Savathun, she actually escapes. Oh, man. Oh, can't believe it. Can't believe that happened. Wow, it's so crazy. She dumps Osiris' body when she breaks out via some sort of teleportation effect, and now we have no idea where she is. Osiris is really Osiris this time, and Mara does have Savathun's worm. The implications of this will hopefully be revealed during the expansion, and now we push into the events of what will be the Witch Queen. Now, 
Last season, I criticized the final mission for not really being any different compared to a normal run of the seasonal activity, which was... Override. It was just in a different location. This time, the final mission was different than a normal astral alignment, so bonus points there. It was another six-player matchmade activity. I think my only criticism this time was that the final boss of said activity dies in about four seconds, and I don't think you really get to appreciate the gravity of the encounter. You know, just getting completely swarmed by enemies from every angle as you defend the Techians. The final cutscene was also an issue for a lot of people because it relied on everyone not skipping it. Spoiler alert, people are both dumb and malicious, not always both. So that caused a lot of people to miss the cutscene completely and have a bugged triumph, which Bungie has fixed, and you can also view the cutscene on their YouTube channel. I will also say that I don't think we needed to wait until the last possible week before Witch Queen to have this mission show up, but I can maybe see why it happened. It's fun to have something happen on the absolute final reset before the expansion to really build the hype. It stays fresh in people's minds as we go into the expansion. Case in point, try to remember basic stuff about this season from when it launched. I imagine some people might struggle with that, because I did, because this season started six months ago. At the same time, dropping the mission two to three weeks out instead of just one, I don't think would have been a huge detriment to the experience. Seasonal content consisted of two activities, Astral Alignment, six player match made, and the Shattered Realm, which was three player. Astral Alignment featured three different objectives to complete with your team, each having their own mechanics. You had carry the batteries, shoot the ether, and drop the ball in the thing. Pretty standard stuff as far as Destiny goes, but still pretty enjoyable. And much like Season 14, I thought it was fine, but I did like it more than Season 14's activity, simply because there were multiple objectives to complete, and enemy density felt mostly good. I think turning up the dial another click or two would have been good, at least outside of the boss room. Again, also like most seasons, I can only do so many runs of a seasonal activity before I mentally check out, and once I got all of the triumphs I needed for this place, I basically never touched it again. The Shattered Realm was where you went after doing an alignment. You did the alignment to get the coordinates, and then you went to the Shattered Realm in order to save the Techians that had been lost in space, time, reality dimensions, whatever. There were three different versions of the realms, each full of little collectibles and lore bits that told you more about the Awoken, Mara, the situation at hand, etc. Each week you had access to more and more upgrades that enabled you to go to different areas of each realm, unlocking more of the hidden collectibles and lore. This was more akin to Season 14's Expunge, than it was Season 13's Presage or Season 12's Harbinger mission. There was also a legendary version that I'm pretty sure people only did for the Triumph and then basically never again. These were pretty fun to dig through. It was exciting week over week to see what new secrets and abilities we're gonna unlock, little lore dumps. I was pretty entertained until I ran out of items to get. Now let's talk about loot. I will say that it was kinda nice not having to worry about some sort of seasonal inventory item that you needed to interact with in order to get loot. Season 13 had hammer charges and all the steps you needed to make loot happen there. And then Season 14 toned it down a little bit, and then Season 15 just straight up had nothing besides currency. And I didn't mind that at all. It's not something that was missed. I never found myself being like, hmm, you know what this needs? Some sort of mechanism that requires me to do things a certain amount of times in a certain order before I can start getting loot from it. No, all of that has been ditched this season, and instead, you just got guns, or you got umbrals, that you can turn into guns. No complex systems, no extra steps, and considering the weapon crafting system that is debuting with Witch Queen, where the main way to level these guns is by just playing the game, I would not be surprised if this kind of Season 15 trend continues. These are not systems that I think people are going to miss, even if they were interesting on paper. Hammer charges were an interesting way of engaging with the loot in Season 13, but ultimately, people just want to be able to farm guns without being told 
what order they need to do a certain sequence in in order to farm guns. Maybe if the guns were above and beyond your typical drops, I could understand the extra work, but on average, they're really not. A trend that I do see continuing is the 7x3 grid of upgrades. It hasn't gone away just yet, so Bungie must like it, but I feel like this has mainly existed to timegate stuff. Parallax Trajectory was this season's currency, which was used on the final chest at the end of an alignment, and then it was used to unlock Wayfinder Compass upgrades, and then when you were done with that, to focus Umbral Engrams. Season 15's suite of weapons were not that very strong at all, to the point where I made a video asking if anyone even cared about any of these guns at all. In a season where fusion rifles became dominant, not even the fusion rifle offered this season in terms of the seasonal weapons could crack like the top 50 in terms of weapons used, with the only real highlight of the six being Fractithist, and that was mainly a PvP option. Some Trials of the Nine weapons came back as part of a loot refresh for the Prophecy Dungeon, then we had a decent amount of world drops having viable weapon rolls, even Zer got to shine a bit this season, dropping a weapon here or there that ended up being a god roll, or dropping some armor pieces here and there that ended up being really strong. Season 15's seasonal exotic was Lawrence Driver, which, given the main seasonal artifact mod, Particle Deconstruction, was downright amazing. While I would not call it a staple weapon by any means, it is an incredibly strong weapon, mainly for massive ad clear, and can serve as a backup boss damage weapon. I'm not sure where linear fusions are going to land in Season 16 and beyond without the help of Particle Deconstruction. Some people are optimistic that they'll continue to be a viable option. Me, I'm, I'm still on the fence. Season 15's Ritual Weapon was Ascendancy, a rocket launcher, which is pretty good in its own right. But Season 14's Ritual Weapon, Null Composure, really got to shine thanks to Particle Deconstruction. Particle Deconstruction was Season 15's meta-defining mod, essentially turning most fusions into top-tier weaponry. Although fast-firing fusions were definitely the most popular due to their higher DPS. And while it was fun to actually see fusion rifles be a top-tier meta option, it was only because Bungie just straight up gave them a massive damage boost that left everything else in the dust. I have my own thoughts on this concept of simply making a certain weapon archetype the de facto meta for a season via artifact mods, but to recap those thoughts, I'm, I'm kind of done with it for now. People are already kind of annoyed with the fact that the seasonal artifact dictates what weapons will be useful in a season. Season 14's mod in Breach and Clear was a novelty because we never had seen anything like it. And Season 15 is also getting a pass because it boosted a weapon class that had never really been good before. But after nine months of this kind of playstyle dictating the meta, I'd be more than okay with getting a breather from these kinds of mods for a couple of seasons. That being said, I do think once we have a season without super strong mods like these, some people are going to get a reality check for how difficult the higher end of content can be. Speaking of Season 15 weapons, Agar Scepter was the exotic quest where we mainly got to learn about the relationship between Crow and Mara. But we also got one of the most powerful weapons in the entire game, kicking the crap out of Cryosthesia 77k from last year's Season Pass. Cryo actually got a pretty good buff in Season 15. While part of me wants to say it's because there would be literally no reason to ever use it over Agar's, Part of the actual reason was because Bungie did not want a gun that could freeze people being too strong when Stasis was still in the process of getting PvP tuning. After seeing its complete lack of performance, it got a buff. People used it for a few days and then they kind of went back to ignoring it. But it's not as bad as it was. Agar Scepter, on the other hand, is an incredibly powerful weapon with plenty of build potential. I enjoyed the lore drops when they happened week over week, but the final part of the quest just ended up being a bunch of busy work in astral alignment, nothing really to write home about. Season 15 also brought infinite primary ammo to the game, which resulted in some tweaks to perks and mods that revolved around primary ammo pickups. This was a pretty well received change in the community, I don't know of many people who have a huge issue with it. 
primary ammo was rarely ever a super valuable resource, save for some very specific instances. You basically never had to worry about it at all, and I don't think this change has affected the game in a statistically significant way. This season also saw huge changes to how ability energy and super energy now work, with abilities getting independent cooldowns based on their strength. And super energy is now mostly gained via the use of kinetic weapon damage. This tuning was meant to change how things kind of worked, but not necessarily change how you end up playing. And I think Bungie hit that goal quite well. Supers feel the same in terms of how much effort is required to get one. Abilities still feel pretty good. And overall, I think very few people felt any significant negative impact of these changes. Trials was also revamped this season. Yeah, it happened this season. I know, I forgot too. At the beginning of the season, I said I would likely engage in playing some more Trials compared to the previous season. And that was indeed true. I did participate in more Trials this season compared to last season. Considering the bar was basically zero games played though, it wasn't really a high bar. They also cranked up the anti-cheat with Battle Eye anti-cheat, although I can't really speak to how effective it has been because I just haven't been engaging in PvP a lot recently, haven't really been feeling it. The changes in Trials revolved around making the experience more accessible and less about trying to hit Flawless on every single card. They made it more accessible by introducing matchmaking. There's less special ammo, faster rounds, more focused on activity versus being passive in a match, no third person emoting, a lot of really good changes. I ultimately ended up still not playing a lot of trials this season because I'm I'm just kind of over it. I very rarely need loot from trials and if I do there's usually an equivalent somewhere else that I can just go get. In terms of the solo experience, the solo experience was best when solo freelance trials was a thing and I don't think I would accept an argument otherwise. As someone who cares significantly more about winning games than getting the loot, I would only ever consider playing Trials solo when it's freelance. I enjoyed it much, much more because of multiple factors. The ability for me to actually go flawless by myself and the lessened psychological effect when I enter a match. When you're solo in the regular playlist and you match against a stack of three, it can feel like the game is already over before it starts. And statistically speaking, that's kind of true. With freelance, that doesn't happen. I realize that I'm not the norm here with this sort of mentality, I'm an outlier, but freelance gives me more chances to actually win games compared to the non-freelance pool. I know that Bungie said they want their matchmaking to be so good that freelance doesn't need to exist, but the skeptic in me doesn't ever really think that's going to happen. Bungie's 30th anniversary was the final big update to the game before Witch Queen launching with a six-player matchmade activity featuring Xur and the Star Horse, the new dungeon in Grasp of Avarice, a bunch of weapons, a bunch of armor, and a bunch of ornaments and cosmetics. I don't know of many people who really took issue with this update and paid content offering. I think it was a very, very well-executed one. Good cosmetics, couple of exotics, G-Horn made its return here. I think the only big issue for a lot of people was the price tag. You did get some stuff for free, and the value of all the items you paid for with the $25 purchase was pretty good if you look at every single item that was offered. Some people don't really care about cosmetics though, so those people might have looked at this as a $25 dungeon and access to G-Horn. But otherwise, this was a pretty well-received addition to the game, but it was made to not feel necessary if you didn't want to get it. G-Horn's return was implemented very well. It is not a gun everyone needs in order to be competitive. The way its exotic perk works actually encourages divinity-like use. Only one person needs to be using it in order for everyone to benefit, which is fantastic. And as I showed in a video, regular rocket launchers will also do really, really well. There were some holiday events, Festival of the Lost, The Dawning, but, you know, they're holidays. I'm just gonna, I'm just gonna gloss over them. Overall, Season 15 felt a lot like Season 11, which I actually never ended up doing a video on because I just didn't. It felt like Season 11 because, well, it was the lead-in to the next expansion. And the seasons that focus on the overall grand scheme of the story feel really good because progression in the story feels good. 
And that's something Bungie has done really, really well this year. In fact, the seasons from this year have felt the most consistent in terms of quality compared to any other year of Destiny. Year 2 of Destiny 2, aka the Forsaken Era, is the only other year that I would say rivaled the quality in terms of seasonal content, although that is partly with the benefit of hindsight. Season 6 wasn't the greatest though, but Season 7 feels like it made up for it. Season 12 started things a bit slow, but the storytelling was nice. Then Season 13 kicked off things really hard. Season 14 was a good follow-up, and Season 15 was also a really good follow-up and lead-in to what I believe will be a top 3 expansion in The Witch Queen. I am feeling the most optimistic about Destiny right now than almost any other point in the history of the franchise. With the Taken King, we were in unknown territory, didn't really know what Bungie was capable of after a rough first year. With Forsaken, it was sort of do or die because of how year one of Destiny 2 went. With Witch Queen, you know, I, I mean, Bungie's been firing on all cylinders for months now, months. And I'll post a video after the Witch Queen slows down a bit talking about what I'm hoping for with Destiny in 2022 as I usually do. But last year, the keyword was innovation. Taking Destiny to new heights, new places, new ideas, big improvements. It was a slow start, but Bungie has been hitting some really good strides. And the quality of the game that we have right now has been very much improved. You know, I still hope formulas get changed up enough to keep things feeling fresh. But as we enter the final expansions for Destiny, I think we enter an era of some of the strongest Destiny stuff that we've ever seen. And Bungie's still working from home too. They're putting out some of their best stuff with everyone working from home. Imagine when they're all back in one place again, when they're back in their brand new office. I would think workflow is maybe enhanced, I don't know, but either way, I'm looking forward to it. Thanks for watching. I'll see you in the next expansion.